Amen. Amen. Well, good evening, friends. I put on this collar uh, to remind you that they still exist. <laughs> <laughs> And also to say, this is um, an interdenominational church. Um, and Mark was very happy to, to actually see me in a collar. When, when Mark came to Uganda, we made him put on one. You should. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but he didn't want any pictures to be taken, otherwise... Uh, <laughs> And um, this young man, Gareth, is actually to blame because when I was doing my seminary, he made sure he kept sending very good books uh, on theology, uh, books on Greek. Um, and so this is to show you that you were not wasting your money in shipping those books. I would like to thank God for this uh, singular opportunity that he has given me to come. Uh, first of all, uh, be part of new wine and be refreshed, but also to uh, uh, really thank Mark for making it possible for me to come. Um, it wasn't going to be very easy, but... Uh, um, when I felt exhausted, I sent him an email and said, uh, Mark, I really need to be refreshed. And he was very gracious and he made it possible for me to come. New wine was very refreshing, even for me. And I don't have time to tell you the experience I had. Uh, but uh, one other interesting testimony is that uh, I was treated to a very nice caravan and yesterday when we were packing up to leave I said oh I'll miss this caravan here. <laughs> it was also very good to witness a holy moment of transitioning of leadership from John and Anne Coles to uh, our friend here Mark and Karen this has not been mentioned here and emphasized, but these are the, the, the leaders of new wine now. So I think we need to appreciate God for that. It was a curious moment. And of course, Trinity, you, your presence was significant. You were visible. And uh, the testimonies we've had here, I think will encourage those of you that have not tried new wine uh, to think of enrolling for attendance next time. I would like to bring you greetings from your friend, uh, Henry Orombi, now retired Archbishop. I informed him I was coming, and he made sure that I bring his greetings to you. I also bring you greetings from uh, my family. I am uh, a husband of but one wife, and uh, <laughs> the Lord has blessed us with three children, uh, David, uh, Marjorie, and Ruth in descending order. Uh, that is uh, Mrs. Me. Her name is Florence. I am currently serving as the provincial Youth and Students Coordinator for the Church of Uganda. What that simply means is that I'm in charge of the youth ministry, uh, overseeing uh, just about seven million young people. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that is me. Uh, that's just part of what we do. We have annual youth conferences. I'm inviting Mark to do one next year. And uh, this is just a response to, to, to a message. So uh, my camera could not cover a panoramic view of, of, of all that were there. That's just part of, uh, these were about 10,000. 
uh, 10,000 young people coming together in one place for five days. And so the Spirit of God is moving and working among young people. And we, it's a huge responsibility that I have. Uganda has the youngest population in the world. A total of 78% of Ugandans are below the age of 30 years. And so I was telling my host, who was very gracious, by the way, uh, John and Margaret, I was telling them that if they were living in Uganda, they would be some of the very few uh, old folk there. <laughs> and uh, our current, um, our current um, life expectancy is 57 years. So uh, some of you, if you were living in Uganda, you would now be living on borrowed time. <laughs> but uh, coming back here, I believe the Lord has given me a message for you. And we are taking it from the gospel according to John. Chapter 12. This is a, a story that you know very well. Uh, John, a friend of, uh, I mean Lazarus, a friend of Jesus. I have I've titled it uh, The Gospel According to Lazarus. Lazarus falls sick. And the sisters send a message to Jesus. Now Jesus was retreating in, at Jordan, in the place where he was baptized. And the message comes, I believe, there was a messenger that, that, that walked there. Uh, there were no telephones, no cell phones then. So he did not receive an SMS. Somebody walked there and said, Jesus, your friend is sick. I'm just giving a little background to John 12. And it was a serious sickness. I'm sure... The sisters were seeing every indicator that their brother was going to die. You know, we hear of terminal illnesses. We hear of uh, life-threatening diseases. And so they send a word to the master, to the friend. The person you love is sick and is dying. And when Jesus heard this, he said, well... This sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory. I think they took the message back home. But a few days later, Lazarus dies because the Bible says that Jesus, after receiving the information, tarried on. He stayed there another two days, so his friend dies. You know, I don't know whether you have experienced um, the, the pain of losing a loved one. We, in, in our family, we are 12, uh, 11, 11 siblings. And I'm the 11th, all by the same father and same mother. So it was a complete football team, 11. <laughs> and of the 11, only... Five of us are still surviving. You know, the, the, the pain of losing a loved one. In 1982, I lost my mother, who I really loved. And, uh, you know, as it were, last bonds, I was my, my father's blue-eyed boy, was my mother's favorite child. And uh, I received news that my mother had died. And this is somebody who invested a lot in me, this is someone who uh, introduced me to the love of Jesus. And so when I heard the news that my mother had died, I said to myself, this God that my, that, that my parents believe does not love you. Because if he loved you, this is now the enemy telling me, your mother would not have died at this juvenile age of yours. And so I turned my back to God. And became wild and uh, crazy. 
and went on the rampage. And uh, um, so, so th there was pain. There was bitterness. How can God take my mother? I was only 16. <coughs> and so this, I believe this is what happened to the sisters of Lazarus. This is somebody who claims that he's a friend of Lazarus. He has performed miracles. He has uh, opened the eyes of the blind. And we tell him about his friend's sickness. And he just tarries on. No wonder they said to him when, when he finally appeared, if you had been here, your friend would not have died. And somehow, Jesus gets to know about it. You know, he, he, he got a word of knowledge. He knew that Lazarus had died. And so he tells the disciples, let's go back uh, to Judea. And the disciples said, you are not serious. The other day, they almost pushed you off a rock. And you narrowly escaped. Now you are saying we should go back? In fact, one of them called uh, Thomas said, well, let's, let's go with him and probably die with him. If you read uh, 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 um, the, the chapter that comes before that. And, uh, and so Jesus says, let our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. This is what he told his disciples in 11 Verse 11, John 11, verse 11. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Praise the Lord. You know what the world calls dead, Jesus calls asleep. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. And so... They go, and uh, at some distance, just uh, when, when, when he was near the home, near the village, um, a message goes, and then the sisters, you know, rush to meet him. And, uh, but you see, when, whenever Jesus appeared, and when he still appears now, the atmosphere changes. And so Jesus appears. When Jesus comes into your situation, he handles it, the atmosphere changes. He finds mourners. You know, in, in those ancient times of Israel, people used to mourn almost professionally. Somebody would, they would even be hired sometimes, you know, they would be hired um, to, to come and mourn uh, for, for the bereaved family, together with the, the, the bereaved family. In Africa, when we lose somebody, you don't need to invite uh, people to come for the funeral. They, they will all come, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and they will mourn with you. And so it's a mourning, a mourning atmosphere. And, and the sister, one of the sisters, Martha, begins to engage Jesus. And she's wailing and crying and, and saying, if you had been here, your friend would not have died. But you see, in her, there must have been this feeling of a sense of betrayal. Jesus, you said that this sickness is not going to lead unto death. Now your friend has died. When we were burying him, you even never appeared, leave alone sending a condolence message. And now you're just coming four days later. It's too late. But you see, friends, God's promises are always yes in Christ. The Bible says, for no matter how many promises... The Lord has made their all yes in Christ. And so the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, is, Jesus comes always, he always comes at the right time. 
somebody has sung the re- lyrics of a song like that. He's ne- he, he never delays, he never hurries, but he always comes at the right time. And so, never say never. Never put a period where God has put a comma. For it's not over till Jesus says it is over. My wife Florence was diagnosed with uh, a cyst on her, on her tubes. And it was four centimeters long. And that was through a scan uh, by a gynecologist. And so she came and told me uh, this devastating news. And I, I'm a brave man, but I, I never want to see someone I love suffering or in pain. And so out of uh, frustration and fear and anxiety, I resorted to prayer. And I mobilized uh, prayer warriors. We started praying for my wife's healing. And I told her, you go, you go back to, to, to the machine. And uh, she went, the thing was still there. Same position, same length, um, same everything. But we never gave up. Because what I have seen personally in my ministry, if there's anything God has graciously uh, shown me in my ministry, it is his power to heal. And so we continued to pray and to believe God for the miracle of healing. And so one day I told her, now you can go back. Because I was very sure that the the miracle had happened. But you see a cyst uh, on on, on a tube. There's no way you can see it until you you, you get to a scan. And that was the day before the operation. And the doctor was saying, hey, Florence, this is long overdue. So she goes. And this doctor uses um, the same scan and says, um, well, Florence, I do not see the cyst. I do not know what has happened, but I don't see it. But I need to refer you to uh, another clinic. This is a, f- a famous clinic in Kampala. They have very good machines and uh, equipment. And so when she tells me that uh, there was no trace of the cyst, This time, I was brave enough to drive her to this other clinic. And we took her, and indeed, the the machines are sophisticated because the the, the doctor was now showing her, uh, using a monitor and saying, you see, the cyst was in this position, uh, but it is not here. This is now okay. Uh, The liver is okay. This is okay. This is okay. Florence there's no trace of the cyst. Amen. Amen. That was two years ago. She never had the operation, and she is not going to have one. And so, Martha begins to engage the master and says, if you had been here, I know that my brother would not have died. And Jesus is saying, look, I I am the the resurrection and the life. She said, I know, I know. I know that indeed there is a resurrection, but it's not now. But she kind of engages him in a theological debate. And, uh, And so Mary comes in, says the same, the approach is the same. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. They're, in other words, blaming it on Jesus. And they say, you, Jesus says, but by the way, where, where did you bury him? They, they took him to the, to the place. And the Bible says that when Jesus got to that very place, he gave thanks to the Father. And he called out in a loud voice the name of Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come out. And at once the grave opened. And Lazarus came out. You see, Jesus demonstrated that indeed he was the resurrection and the life. Our life is in his hand. 
and he had to call him by the name Lazarus. Do you know why? If he had not specified, then all the dead would have come out of their graves and the earth would not accommodate them. There would be too many. <laughs> you see, everything that has got a name has got an ear. I'd like you to tell this to your neighbor and say, neighbor, everything, tell your neighbor, not me, <laughs> everything that has got a name, I want to hear you say that, everything that has got a name has got an ear. And so we must begin to speak into situa we, we must begin to speak to situations. We must begin to speak to sicknesses and, and, and disease and conditions and things that appear before us like mountains. Speak to that situation. And when he's, when he's up, he's up, but he's in his grave clothes. And so Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Do you know what we're going to do this evening? There are Christians who are Christians, yes. But somehow they are still bound. They're bound by fear. They're bound by worries and anxieties, some of these little habits. You know, you, you confess a sin uh, in new wine. And for two days, you are free from that. But when you come back, then you go back to the same sin. You, we're going to untie you in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, finally, John 12. A dinner is given in the honor of Jesus. That's verse 1. Uh, John 12, verse 1. And I will read it to you. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those um, who were reclining at the table with him. Now, notice that in two verses, the name Lazarus is mentioned twice. This is what we call the law of repetition. And this is done uh, for emphasis. It's done for emphasis. Actually, Lazarus is the host. But why would the writer, the, the, the press man, the, the one who captured the news, why is he interested in Lazarus? The dinner is given in the honor of Jesus. This is in Bethany, where Lazarus lived. Now, you want to ask yourself this question, why Lazarus? Think of, um, uh, you know, somebody hosting Jesus in Cheltenham here. And, and then they say, where Gareth lives. Uh, you know, or oh, Sam maybe. Let me use Sam. I think it, it will make you feel good. Uh, where, where Sam lives. Now, you want to ask yourself, why Sam? Is he the only one living in Cheltenham? And here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. Now, in a way, Lazarus stole the show. The, the dinner is actually given in Jesus' honor. But this gentleman called Lazarus actually steals the show. Do you want to know that? Do you want to prove that? Let's fast forward to, to verse 9. Let's fast forward to verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came. You see, Jesus was a crowd puller. But, and so was Lazarus. They came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. They came to see Jesus, but so also to see Lazarus. And this is what happens, friends, 
when someone experiences the power, the saving grace of God. When you become a Christian, you become a center of attraction for God's deliverance power. Every Christian is meant to be attractive. Attractive. When I was in primary four, I was told about the, 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 the effect of light to plants. And so there was a little dark room and they, create, they created a hall somewhere and put a plant, uh, some seedling, uh, in that dark room. And it grew towards the hall where the light was coming from, <coughs> coming in through. It was called uh, positive phototropism. Now, every Christian is supposed to be phototropic. You're supposed to attract people. You are a center of attraction, not for the makeups, uh, not for looking sharp and, uh, and nice. You have a lot of beautiful women, by the way. <laughs> and um, I think if I hadn't married Florence, I would have uh, uh, dated somebody here, probably. <laughs> but you see, it's not about, it's not about that. It's uh, the, the, the center of attraction for God's deliverance power. For God, and that is Lazarus here. I was privileged to minister with a lady from, uh, she was a missionary to Uganda. She hailed, uh, I think, from uh, Wellingbra. And, uh, and one day she took me out. I was high interpreter uh, back home. And one day she took me out to do ministry. Uh, she was praying for the sick. And as she prayed for this woman, the demons manifested. And I remember the woman opening wide her eyes and becoming very violent and, and tall as I am, I tried now to sneak away and disappear <laughs> and leave this sister of yours to, to handle. <laughs> and uh, I got frightened. Even the demons noticed that I was frightened. And they said, let that man go. The demons are now speaking. Let him go. And I actually left, you know. And, and so Marjorie Bolton, uh, uh, bless her, she, she was promoted to glory. Uh, later on said, Onesimus, I know you're a wonderful man. You're a Christian, but I think you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I didn't know what that was. I was a very good Anglican. I knew I was baptized when uh, an infant. And, uh, and, uh, but she went on and prayed for me later that evening. And I became very vulnerable. And somehow I received this, this baptism of the Holy Spirit because I found myself down there. The floor was not as nice as this one. <laughs> but I went down anyway. And, uh, and, and I was speaking in strange tongues, some funny language that I didn't understand. And uh, since then, since then, I started also, uh, I, I don't look for demons, but when I meet them, I chase them out of God's people. Amen. And so, um, th this is, and, and because of that, I started attracting people. And it put me in trouble because at some point, my, the church authorities where I served in my diocese said, this young man is uh, now, you know, doing something that is not compatible with our tradition here, you know, because I was chasing out demons and praying for the sick. And, and, and so anyway, um, that is the experience I had, and it made me different made me different. I visited a friend of mine in uh, Little Over um, in Dabe. And this was a, a great guy. Great guy. Very, very nice man. And, and um, I had been tired, of course, having had the flight the previous night and uh, the time difference is not so much, but I, I had a little bit of jet lag. This was 2003, I think. And so 
he wanted to leave very early in the morning. And uh, somehow he thought probably I would want to watch television uh, when I woke up the following morning. So what he did was uh, he wrote some notes for me, said Vanessmas, I'm away to work out. And uh, just in case you want to watch television, this is what you do. You press this button and do this. And, and uh, he, he was even an artist, so he drew a picture of a television set and, <laughs> and uh, gave me instructions on how to turn it on and, you know. And so I got up. It was placed on, my, on, the, on, on the dining uh, table. And I read the notes and I looked at the set. I said, well, I, I think to impress him, I will indeed, when he comes, I will tell him I watched some news. And so I followed the instructions and I turned on the television. Now, there had been some lead light already indicating in the set. On the set was a lead light. I think that's what we call a pilot light. Uh, but there were no pictures. The wonderful giant flat screen was, was blank. So until I pressed some button, did the pictures actually appear? You know? What did I learn from that? I learned that there could be two television sets in a room, one with pictures, another one without pictures. What is the difference? The difference lies in pressing that button. There could be Christians who are actually on their way to heaven, God's property, on transit to heaven. And you're going there, there's no doubt about that. But until you turn on some button, will you begin to experience some of these things that we talk about? When you hear people giving testimonies, you know, these things will not happen until you turn on that button. And I pray that you'll do it this evening. I have seen miracles, and I just want to conclude with, uh, um, you know, some of uh, the things that I've seen the Lord do. In 1996, a couple, a couple came to us from Rwanda. This, I was living uh, in a place near, near Rwanda. And this was a priest and his wife, Augustine. Uh, he gave me permission to use his name. And, and, and Josephine. And they spent Christmas, Christmas holiday with us. And the day before they returned to Rwanda, we had a family altar, a time of prayer together as a family. And I saw this beautiful woman, very beautiful woman, looking miserable. And somehow prompted by the Spirit of God, I asked her, I said, Josephine, is there any special need that, you know, you'd like us to address in prayer? And she said, yes. For the last six years, we've been married, but I've never conceived. I don't have a child. And now in Africa, uh, ladies, it's, it's a kind of abomination <coughs> to be married and you don't produce a child. And they always blame the ladies, even when the problem is the man's, sometimes. And so... I said, no, let's, let's believe God for a miracle child. And we prayed for her, my wife and I. We laid hands on both of them. And the Spirit of God prompted me to quote, he brought a scripture into my spirit. Um, Exodus 23, I believe it is verse 25 and 26. And it says, you shall worship the Lord your God and he will bless your food and water and none of the women in your land will be barren or even miscarry, uh, uh, Onesimus version, something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so I spoke the scripture, and this was the hardest part of the prayer. I said to her, woman, now look at me. And she looked at me. I said to her, at around this time next year, you will be having a child. That was Christmas 1996. It was in the evening. And I went to bed, and do you think I slept? 
the devil was telling me, why did you have to say that? <laughs> you should only have prayed. Now, suppose she has no uterus. Suppose she doesn't conceive. What are you going to do? They're going to think you're a false prophet. You're never, ever going to preach in Rwanda again. But Christmas 1997, the Lord had already given them that beautiful boy, and they named him Jaire. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that is the same boy uh, at the age of 10. He's, he's a beautiful boy. This is, he's too, too handsome to be called handsome. He's, he's beautiful. <laughs> and then a year later, the Lord gave them Nathan. They now live in Canada. And when I heard that uh, Nathan had arrived, I, I, I wrote them an email. They, they, I said, you had better practice some family planning. The speed was too much. <laughs> and, and I have since then seen God releasing, you know, barren women. I've seen God uh, releasing them. I mean, they're, 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 they're uncountable. Uh, this other one, uh, the mother came and told me, she had given birth to that, that, that girl, and uh, the girl was now 12 years, and they had not had another, uh, another baby. So I prayed. I prayed for her, and that little baby, baby arrived. You can see the difference, the age difference. The, the, that is her follower, you know, and, and many others. And so, friends, this God we talk about, he brings life into dead situations, and that is what happened for Lazarus. It can happen for your situation. And I want us to pray. I was given 30 minutes. Now, in Africa, 30 minutes is just introduction to a sermon. So, <laughs> and, and, and it is all gone now. So we need to pray anyway. But um, uh, next time, give me an hour. <laughs> I want us to pray. And uh, believe God to bring any dead situation in your life back to life. It can be a business. It can be a relationship. It can be a sickness. You see, I don't believe in, in what your doctors call uh, terminal conditions. I don't believe in that. I'm sorry. I have a family doctor, but I disagree with him many times. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's, you see, you see, with all due respect, doctors do not heal. They only treat. It is only God who heals. If doctors would heal, their children would not fall sick. They would not die. They, they, the doctors themselves would not die. One of the best doctors we had in Uganda, my brother-in-law, died of cancer. He was a presidential physician. And so uh, God ultimately is our healer. And I want us to believe God for even what is called hard conditions and, uh, and, uh, and terminal conditions and, 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 and just believe God to do. I have tried even, by the way, raising the dead. My sister-in-law died, uh, my, my wife's uh, sister. And um, before, before we buried her, I said, let's, let's try this. Let's try this. So I called a few pastors and we prayed for her. And uh, um, I actually said, I asked one of them to, to move aside. I wanted to open the lid because I felt she was about to get out. And, and as we prayed, I felt the Lord telling me, Onesimus, I have seen your faith. You can now go ahead and bury her, whatever that means. But what, what I believe is one of these days, I will even raise this, the, the dead in the name of Jesus. The doctors had done what you call post-mortem. You see, when someone dies, they, they take out the heart, they remove the lungs, they, so, which makes the miracle even more complicated, really. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and, and should I die if, if, if Christ studies? I wouldn't want anyone to start opening my body and taking off the lungs and put, you know. But anyway, um, why don't we pray?